Um, strange system. So um, I would like to start our webinar by introducing our new publication and revealing why do we need responsible peatlands management. Last but not least, I will you introduce you a concept of responsible peatlands management. So the guidebook's title is Towards Climate Responsible Peatlands Management. It is a result of a collaborative effort involving 61 specialists. It consists of 19 chapters divided into three sections, peatlands characterization and consequences of utilization, improved management practices and the case studies. For those who are new to the field, let's start with introducing some concepts, definitions, and explaining what exactly state of the art about peatlands currently. Peatlands store a significant proportion of the carbon. It is estimated that even though they covered only 3% of terrestrial surfaces, they already accumulate around 30% of the world soil carbon, which is equal to 85% of a global vegetation and 75% of all atmospheric carbon. So it's a huge amount of the carbon located in a small area. Peatlands are very diverse and they have a unique biodiversity. They can be forested or afforested, as you can see on some images on the slide. Um, overall, there are no consistent definitions or unique definitions all over the globe for peatlands. As a general definition, they can be defined as a land with a naturally accumulated peat layer at their surface, and the peat consists of mo mostly partially decomposed vegetation. On the images on the side of the slide, you see that the example of the peat soil from the oil palm forest plantation in uh, Southeast Asia, as well as um, sphagnum mosses, which are the main component of the boreal peatlands. Pits abstract. Um, in order to reflect regional and national differences, country-based peatlands definitions should be applied consistently across national land area and over time, according to the IPCC guidelines. Peatlands can be found in all climatic zones. The highest proportion per area of the country can be found in the boreal region in Canada, Sweden, Finland, Russia, as well as the tropical region, mostly in the Southeast Asia. However, there are, no, there are currently very high uncertainties in the coverage estimates because mapping of peatlands is not easy as there are no generally accepted operational definitions and the use of remote sensing technologies is made difficult by the fragmented distribution pattern of peatlands and their differentiated land use. It's also highlighted the difficulties by the inherent environmental problems of conducting ground observations in many peatlands areas, especially in the tropical regions. Peatlands currently are the major greenhouse gas emitters in agriculture. So it is estimated that around 0.2% of the global land surface is covered by the drained peatland, but they already cause at least 10% of greenhouse gas emissions of agriculture, forest, and land use change sector following the enteric fermentation. Most of the emissions are coming from the Southeast Asia, leading place in Indonesia, then USA, Papua New Guinea, Malaysia, Russian Federation, Bangladesh, Belarus, Myanmar, Poland, and Canada. What is causing this high amount of greenhouse gas emissions? So drainage is the main cause of the high greenhouse gas emissions. Emissions increase proportionally as water tables are lowered below 0.5 meters, which is necessary for most crops productions and plantations on peatlands. Whilst peatlands drainage and conversion to agriculture has virtually ceased in the boreal and temperate zone countries, it is increasing in tropics. When peatlands are drained, a decrease in the methane emissions can be observed. However, there is a dramatic increase in the carbon dioxide and nitrous oxide emissions, 
Also, there is an increased fire frequency, which leads to additional greenhouse gas emissions. Drainage also leads to increased loss of carbon via the water pathways in form of the dissolved organic carbon. In the end, peatlands turn in from the net so into the net source of the greenhouse gas emissions. And a lowering water table by additional 10 centimeter might cause additional 10, <clears throat> 10 tons of the carbon dioxide emissions. The current major driver in the tropical regions are palm and palpable plantations. Here you can see an example where a very rich with the biodiversity peatland is turned into a um, palm oil plantations, which lose not only to the carbon loss, also to biodiversity loss, and may lead to the land tenure conflicts. For the accounting it is of greenhouse gas emissions and the DOC laws, the tier one approach can be applied by using the emission factors of the produced by IPCC 2013 wetland supplement, which includes updated emission factors for greenhouse gases, off-site carbon dioxide emissions associated with dissolved organic carbon release, methane emissions from drainage ditches, and um, um, greenhouse gas losses from pit fires. Also, tier two and tier three approaches can be used by using national data. In the guidebook that I already introduced you, there's a table compiling emission factors for different climatic zones and different land uses, forest, forestry, grasslands, croplands, plantations, and rice. It introduces emission factors for organic carbon, methane, and nitrous oxide. And you can see that the climatic factor significantly affects the amount of the emissions for example, for the forestry practice, we see that there is up to five times difference between the tropical and the boreal zones. There are much more any different other consequences caused by the peatlands drainage, a part of the huge amount of greenhouse gas emissions. Also, drainage leads to the land loss, increases fire frequencies, increases dissolved organic carbon loss and the biodiversity loss. Each of them cause some additional impacts, like a land loss can lead to the salt water intrusion in the coastal areas, agricultural productivity loss, soil erosion, increased risk of flooding, and many other consequences. For example, here's a, on the image, you can see a consequence of the land loss as land subsidence in Southeast Asia, that during the 28 years, there was a decrease in the land surface of 230 centimeters. And in the beginning of the establishing of the plantations, there is a very high rate of the land subsidence, up to 50 centimeters per year in the newly drained areas. With the time, it's getting less. But it still continues uh, until the pavement is not getting revetted. Peatlands fires cause also national and international problems. Like, as you remember from the media a couple of years ago, that the big fires in Russia were burning for months because it was very difficult to seize the fire as they continue underground. Similarly, in the media, you saw maybe in the news, in the gardens, that uh, smoke from the fires in uh, Indonesia were traveling towards Malaysia, which was additional uh, giving uh, health problems to people in Malaysia. What can be done to reduce greenhouse gas emissions and other consequences of drainage? Simple rules can be followed. All wet peatlands should be kept wet. Drained peatlands should be revetted. They can be revetted and be restored to previous ecosystem conditions or on the revetted areas can be applied responsible peatlands management. If rewetting is not possible, then adaptive management should be applied. Benefits of restoring of peatlands are numerous. They reduce greenhouse gas emissions, regulate water retention, better flood protection, 
and ad adaptation to water level changes. They safeguard water quality, conserve biodiversity, provide fishing opportunity, reduce risk of wildfires, and regulate local microclimate. Overall, peatlands rating is a rewarding process. What exactly we understand under responsible pet peatlands management? This kind of a management should reduce greenhouse gas emissions, adapt ecosystem to climate change, improve livelihoods of local people. Of course, for each country context, this can be altered and prioritized one or the second aspect, but overall three core benefits can go along. A potential practice for responsible peatland management can be polyculture practices, which is a biomass cultivation on a wet and derivated peatlands. They provide synergies for production, biodiversity conservation, climate change mitigation, and a fire hazard reduction. More details about polyculture practices you will hear during the next presentations. Some take home messages. Drainage of peatlands causes high greenhouse gas emissions and harmful environmental consequences. Therefore, it's important to halt peatlands drainage and revet all the redrained areas where it is possible. Uncertainties in peatlands coverage leads to variability in greenhouse gas estimates. Therefore, it is important to develop new maps of peatlands. For drained peatlands, responsible peatlands management practices should be applied. Therefore, it is important to allocate incentives and funding for research, testing, and promotion of such practices. I would like to thank you for your attention. In case if you would like to receive some more information about the guidebook or a hard copies of the guidebook, please contact us, and we will send you as soon as it will be possible.